Welcome to the Monocle Podcast. We are an independent management consulting firm, and in this podcast, we discuss our latest insights and opinions to help you achieve exceptional performance in banking and insurance together. Welcome to the Monocle Insights Podcast. I'm Guy Wilding, Monocle's research manager based in Johannesburg. And on today's podcast, we are joined by Inclant Lamotta, one of our senior execs, to discuss the reforms to the BA 900 series and as a part of the regulatory returns for banks. You know, regulatory reporting has been a significant topic for Monocle, particularly last year where we held our webinar um, around the reliability of regulatory reporting with Rita Dupria. So it's great to pick back up on this topic again this year. So Inclancler, welcome to the podcast and it's great to have you. Uh, thanks for having me, Guy. I'm really looking forward to this. I've been enjoying uh, the podcast and hopefully, you know, we can share some insights into the developments in terms of BA 900. So a big part of reg reporting or regulatory reporting that we focus on is the information asymmetry. So that talks to kind of regulators not having an inside view into bank performance and bank stability, which puts them at a disadvantage. And that's why regulatory reporting has become such a critical component of modern day banking as we see it now, from IFRS financial reporting to the reports required for market conduct and tax and AML, there are a host of regulatory reporting requirements. So just to set us up for the rest of the podcast, can you explain to us what the BA returns are specifically, as well as their importance to the banking industry? No, for sure. Thank you. Um, so firstly, it's very important to understand the role that central banks actually play in the banking sector from a regulatory perspective. And when you're looking at things like the, the regulatory returns, things like the, the BA100, the BA900, these are just uh, returns that are required to be submitted by the banks to the sub on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on the specific return. But it's actually driven by the Banks Act itself. And the importance thereof is that the, the, the function that is served by the regulator, or rather the central bank in this case, is obviously around monetary policy, financial stability, prudential regulation, you know, some research, statistical purposes. And there's a wide range of data that is actually required by the banks for, for the SOP to actually achieve some of its strategic initiatives for, uh, you know, the greater economy. And of course, to be re- able to report to, you know, other financial institutions that are of an international basis. So they use the BA returns to be able to actually do this on a monthly and a quarterly basis. And just to give you a high level view, right, there's, there's a number of BA returns and they serve different purposes. For instance, you've got market risk returns like the BA 320. You've got the BA 100 that looks at the balance sheet just based on IFRS reporting. You also have, you know, the analysis of sales and transactions for leasing which is the 920 and got like the institutional and maturity breakdown of the liabilities and, and assets coming from the Bay 900 and you've got a host of other returns and all of this come in to assist the regulators drive out better financial stability across and of course to make sure that the banks are operating in a prudent manner as well. So that's a great summary of what's included in the BA returns and it's good to know that there's more than just the BA 900 series which is something that you've been focusing on specifically since the Saab issued some reforms back in, I think it was 2018. And maybe you can just give us a bit more detail. You explained which are the reports that make up the series for the 900. But can you explain why the reforms were introduced by the Saab um, and what are some of the reasons for these changes? So the whole requirements from banks has really, has really tightened uh, events such as you know the the global financial crisis of 08 09 has really put a microscope on banks in terms of what is required from them and the granularity and the comprehensiveness of the data they're getting so the this has really been on on the cards for a while the last review of the BA 900 series was around 2008 we should tell you you know that a lot of time has passed since then so one of the things that has actually driven the change in the BA 900 series is an is a exercise or rather initiative that was done by the G20. They went on a data gaps initiative where they wanted to actually ascertain and identify how comprehensive and timely can we actually get economic and financial data that is actually requested from the different agencies uh, such as banks. And they came up with 20 recommendations to enhance the economic and financial statistics with a huge focus, of course, on the availability of the data 
and the comparability of that data, financial and economical, and to allow for early monitoring and stress of different sectors within the economy to apply appropriate intervention measures beforehand. So, you know, with South Africa belonging to the G20, we are compelled to actually drive out some of those requirements that are required by the G20. So that's sort of the the overarching requirement that has come in here. You know, we know now why it's come into effect, but what are the really big changes, the big variances that we're seeing? You know, just to name a few, we look for current way that the BA900 is required. There's not a proper distinction, you know, in terms of trading versus banking book. There's more requirements around credit impairments, whereas in the previous one, there wasn't really that much granularity required. And there's also some netting and offsetting requirements that have come into play. And a better split between the different sectors for each product, given their specific maturity that is required. And speaking of maturity, um, one of the things to note is that in the current BA 904, most of the financial instruments are actually reported on the remaining maturity basis. Whilst in the new one, it will be actually reported on the original maturity basis. And the reason is that the remaining maturity speaks more to analyzing liquidity, whereas the original maturity is more relevant rather to to the monetary statistics and better reflects the intention of the money holder to begin with. So that's sort of some of the differences that we're seeing between the new and the old. And of course, just the layout itself. They're giving it more of a, of a balance sheet look and feel where you've got the assets at the top, then equity, then liabilities. Whereas in the previous one, it wasn't you know laid out like that. Yeah, I think a big thing that's coming out of new regulatory reporting is the need for more detail, for more granular detail. And while it will help regulators in the long term, the actual implementation of that yeah. and trying to find, source that data and build it into data models can become a very huge task or very complex mm. task. Um, and that kind of leads us on to the next point around the challenges mm. of the reforms. It's obviously uh, these these reports, especially the BA 900 having almost a balance sheet view, it has a significantly large scale. So maybe you can take us through some of the challenges that you've encountered when helping some of our banking clients with these BA 900 reforms. Mm, for sure. Because of the changes that are being required by the SAB for more granular reporting in the BA 900, it does imply that banks have to adjust their current data models to accommodate these changes um, and the data fields that are actually required. And the challenge then becomes, how do we you know standardize the, the, the reporting? And how does the new requirements speak to our current reporting architecture, given different sources from different business units, speaking to different products with different maturity uh, bucketing? How do we ensure that our reporting architecture is still consistent with what the new revisions actually want? I know how do we optimize the operating model for this in, in, in production? What does the new business as usual look like after we've actually implemented this? How do we improve the data quality? This is a great opportunity, you know, for banks to take a step back and say, how are we actually doing our regulatory reporting? Um, You'll find that in most cases, it's not as centralized as you might think. Another big challenge is, of course, data ownership, given the vast amount of data that actually sits in the banks. And if we are going to try to implement these new changes that are required or rather these new revisions, how do we actually ensure appropriate data ownership across the different streams to ensure that it's accurate, it's complete, and it's on time? And of course, how do we then incorporate automation as, as part of this process and rethinking the different processes? Some of them are very manual. How do we take a step back and say, you know, how can we better make this more efficient from the get-go and start getting more accurate data with no manual intervention? So it's a huge ask. It's a big challenge, but the data is there. It's just a matter of taking a step back and understanding how we can better operationalize this. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned data ownership because on uh, the Monaco webinar we had last year, Rita Dupree also mentioned a, a very similar thing about going back to basics with data governance in order to improve your reliability of regulatory reporting. So it's definitely a kind of a consistent uh, theme that, that we see when we talk about reg reporting. Mm. You know, having a webinar on this and multiple podcasts on this topic, it's definitely a changing topic or a, a rig reporting is a topic that for, for Monaco is very important. Um, it aligns very closely to our expertise in that we have 
a vast amount of technical understanding around the reg reforms and the regs themselves, as, as well as the insights into our clients, our banking clients and their data architectures, their data infrastructure, which mm. gives us a, a great platform to assist our banking clients. So where has Monaco been involved in assisting our clients to implement these BA 900 reforms? That's a very good question. From a, from a BA 900 perspective, to your point, it touches a lot of stakeholders. Whether we're talking CIB, whether we're talking you know, uh, retail and business banking, everyone is affected because from a balance sheet perspective, that all rolls up into the BA 900. And where Monaco has really come in in assisting uh, our clients uh, meet these requirements is number one, we take our time in understanding what the regulations actually want. What are the changes? You know, what is currently happening? What does the SOAP actually want? And what is the gap between the two? And do we understand that gap? Is it a data gap? Is it a timing gap? Is it that the data is not there? It still needs to come through. So we do a proper, you know, analysis of the current situation, obviously being informed by what the regulations and the revisions are on. So once we, we come in from a business analysis perspective, understanding the different processes that actually make up the current process and how that might change in the future depending on the solution that the bank actually goes with to be able to meet these revisions. So we've really come in in terms of business and data analysis and understanding what the revisions actually are and what the SAB is actually requiring. And of course, leveraging a lot on, on some of the other work that we're doing in the different business units within the banks to better understand the architecture, the sourcing of the data, and to better understand our stakeholders and, again, to the data ownership question, to better understand the data lineage and how that will flow into the current requirements of the Saab. And, of course, we also do get involved in the solutioning itself, right? So once we've understood the process, once we've done a proper gap analysis and understanding of what is required, we don't step back, you know, and say, okay, now our job is done. We are quite heavily involved in the actual solutioning of the project and driving out those requirements, uh, whether it's through writing out the specs that will be used by the developers or writing out the code ourselves and testing it out. We're heavily involved in the user acceptance testing that might be done depending on the solution that the bank will go for. So that is really sort of where we come in and try to assist our clients. And also because there's a significant number of BA returns and they need to reconcile. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the reconciliations uh, between these different reports. As, as I had mentioned earlier, there are quite a number of BA returns. And these BA returns, obviously, for some of the data, it shouldn't be viewed in isolation. So things like the BA 900 form, for instance, it needs to be reconciled back to the BA 100 every single month. And they need to talk to each other. So those reconciliation points become a very crucial part. And that's where automation could come in, in driving out some business rules that can actually make the reconciliation process much easier before you actually submit to the sub. And I saw when we were talking about uh, the challenges of implementing and and Monaco being involved, the the challenges present opportunities. And I think it's important Mm -hmm. to talk about the strategic long-term view of reg reporting because it's it's not going away. Like we'd mentioned, it's almost a critical part of, of modern-day banking in terms of building out reliable regulatory reporting. So well, what have you seen in banks? Have there been any moves towards using these reforms as a way to implement new strategic projects or to kind of revamp their uh, reporting infrastructure? For sure. We're definitely seeing that in our, in our clients. The implementation of of these revisions present obviously an opportunity for the banks to change and upgrade their current data architecture, you know, review their operational processes and systems and really allow for enhancements in terms of business optimization and improve alignment between statutory and regulatory reporting. This means that taking the opportunity to better the robustness and the timeliness of production of the BA returns. This means that, you know, looking for automation opportunities for better data management and controls and data quality and, um, you know, revising the operating model and allow for the ability for the enrichment of the data downstream that really allows the bank to be agile in the way that they do their regulatory reporting. And one of the ways is to really have a, a centralized view of the data. 
uh, we're seeing a lot of a sort of a siloed approach in terms of the way the regulatory reporting is done right now. Each business unit would do its own B900 and then it's reconciled manually and then there's commentary that is required and all the recons are actually done manually and then you submit to the sub and then the sub will come back with queries and will require more detail and commentary because it could be that the data itself was not to the quality they required or they just need some clarity and one of the ways that there's revisions there, the opportunity that presents is to be able to have, you know, one central view of the reporting in that you source all the data, for instance, into one data warehouse uh, where you've automated the sourcing from golden source. You've you built all your business rules, your data validations, your data quality into one. And you avoid things like, you know, manual processing, allow for enrichment of data. And because of the single source of data, the process becomes a little bit seamless. And of course, allowing them for commentary before you actually submit to the SAP. So the automation of the data sourcing and then that being sourced into one central repository where we can, you know, drive out proper quality checks and do some ETLs and business rules before submission, you know, would really achieve a great lot in terms of just the timeliness of the reporting and save business a lot of time in terms of the manual processing that is currently being done around the banks. And I think to wrap uh, wrap up the episode, can you give us a little bit of detail around the timelines uh, for the reforms? Yes, of course. So we have to show regulatory compliance by December 2022 with parallel runs scheduled for 2023. These have actually been extended. Initially, the go-live date was actually supposed to be this year in uh, mid-2022, and it was extended by the SAB to 2023. So those are the high-level timelines that we're looking at. But as you know, you know, some of these are not set in stone and we could see a different picture depending on how rapid and how quick the compliance actually comes through from the banks. Great. Reg reporting, it's definitely a topic that we keep coming back to. It's deeply embedded and maybe in sometimes convolutedly embedded in banking, but it's important that banks get it right. And you know, to hear you talk about the long-term solutions, I think is critical for our banking clients going into the future. Thanks, Nkvantla, for coming on the podcast. It's really been great to have you um, and also to hear more about the work that Monaco's been involved in. No, fantastic. Thank you for, for having me. I look forward to hearing more of these. I really do enjoy them. And for our listeners who would like to learn more about what we do at Monaco, you can visit our website to understand our core expertise and view our range of insights and Monaco case studies. Similarly, if you'd like to contact us, you can find all our details on our website for both our European and South African practices. Thanks again, Kleinfler, and to our listeners, thank you for listening. Visit monoclesolutions.com to subscribe for updates. From Johannesburg to London, Cape Town to Amsterdam, Monocle, we design change.